here after the summer. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, okay. And, uh, That's fabulous. This series is um, basically dedicated to giving a forum to uh, authors whose books uh, are either unfairly ignored or unjustly attacked. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to be able to welcome tonight uh, John Atlas, who has written uh, a, an indispensable book uh, of the story of Acorn, which, uh, as you have probably heard, was very successfully accused by uh, Bush Cheney team of um, uh, engaging in widespread voter fraud. And indeed, because of that propaganda drive against Acorn, the myth took, uh, you know, a very important myth took hold, and that is the myth that the Democratic Party has been stealing elections for the last 10 years. Now, I've written a fair amount myself about election fraud and propaganda, enabling it and concealing it. Uh, but I, I really didn't know the story of, of Acorn itself, and John Atlas has told that story in his book, Seeds of Chain, which he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, his talk will help us understand why it was so important uh, to bring Acorn down, to shatter it, because in its way, it was a formidable force. Uh, John was, for many years, a public interest lawyer he was a, uh, a housing activist, and in that connection, he got to know the people at Acorn very well, and he got uh, unprecedented access to all their archives and to their people. And when he started writing the book, and let me anticipate what he's going to say, when he started writing the book in 2004, he had no idea that the story was going to become so dramatic and that Acorn was going to become so notorious, nor that we end up, uh, you know, smash his smithereens. So he watched the whole story unfold in real time and is now here to tell us about it. So as usual, what's going to happen tonight is that uh, we will talk for 20 or so minutes and then uh, we'll open the floor up to uh, questions, after which he'll be, he'll be slathering to buy his book and we'll have the opportunity to have him sign a copy, right? We'll all do that, of course. So um, please join me in welcoming John Adams. Thanks so much for the introduction. And as you know, I'm an admirer of uh, the books that you have written in the, in, the, uh, in the past and the ones that will come out in the future. So I'm here to talk. I wrote the book on Acorn. And uh, I'm here to warn you about America's most dangerous organization. Uh, not only um, is this organization accused of engaging in voter fraud, but they've been accused of voting of uh, voter intimidation, causing the subprime crisis, misusing federal funds, stealing an election. Uh, its members have been caught having relations with prostitutes. Uh, maybe uh, and. Uh, they have uh, pressured large, large corporations uh, to give them money by using intimidating tactics. You may be surprised to know all this is true. Huh? But you know what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about the Republican Party. <laughs> now, the irony, of course, well, need I remind you of uh, Bush versus Gore, where Bush lost the election and then won the election? Uh, voter intimidation has been part of the Republican Party uh, two tools for decades. Uh, I can remember 1981, uh, uh, civil rights groups had to bring a lawsuit uh, to stop the Republican Party from intimidating voters and stifling minorities uh, to vote. Um, uh, the subprime crisis? the foot soldiers for the advance, the attack on bank regulation. It, it was 
John McCain, then the rest of the Republican Party. The Democrats were involved, but so were the Republicans. Um, but it, K Street, prostitution, remember Senator Vitter, uh, Larry Craig? Okay. So you get the point. The irony is that Karlov, the Republican Party leadership, um, McCain, Palin, Limbo, Beck, Andrew Breitbart, Andrew Breitbart, the latest in the uh, gang of uh, Republicans, all falsely accused Acorn of all the accusations I just said. That's right, I said falsely Acorn was not guilty of any of those accusations. None of them. It is a classic strategy. Well, at least it's a Republican strategy. Divert public attention away from the fact that Republicans are guilty of all these misdeeds uh, by accusing Acorn of them. Now, the puzzle for me is, was, as I was writing this book, and I said, well, this is coming out, somehow the Republican Party used these false accusations to discredit Acorn, defame it, and try to destroy it. And the question is, what was ACORN? Why did the Republican Party go after ACORN? And how in the world did they make these accusations stick? And I'll just give you one uh, outlandish example. Did you know that 52, the reliable polls report, 52% of Republicans believe that ACORN stole the 2008 election. Now here is a, an election in which the, the Obama won by seven or eight million votes. And yet, and yet, 52% of Republicans believe Obama stole the election. And I might add, it's not just the Republicans that believe the accusations because a lot of Democrats must have too because recall, it was the Democratic Congress that defunded ACORN. It was critical in helping to unravel the group. So my book tries to unravel this mystery. Uh, and, and I, as Mark said, mine is a fact-based story. It's a character-driven, it's a, um, all, I'm telling you, as Mark said, in real time. I started in 2004, and I, and I thought I was writing a book about the best community organization that nobody ever heard of, and that you should have. But all of a sudden, it's turning into a totally different story, which gives us a window into better understanding today's politics, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the role of the mainstream media, the role of the right-wing media, uh, as well as Obama, and it also gives us considerable insight into the progressives and the, and left, the left and liberals. Uh, I had no intention of having this as, as my theme. It was mostly following a current seeing its success and failures, its strengths and weaknesses. And so, actually, you'll be surprised to know that most of the book is about, is a, is a story of hope. It's a story of proof that it is possible in America to make, for everyday people, acting together to try and help this country be a better place. And I think it's a book that every caring uh, person cared, who has deep values about justice, opportunity, democracy, and community, uh, to see that we can make a big difference, a big difference. Uh, well, in fact, I'm going to tell you in a second what I think is the heart of the Acorn story, and that is who they were, what they accomplished, and how they accomplished it. Before they do that, I can tell you that um, many people always want to know, uh, why did I write the book? And. Uh, But you know, before I do that, I think I'm going to take you back to the beginnings of ACORN. Uh, let me read something out of the book. Uh, 
Um, this is a this is a story, as I said, of a group of young men and women inspired by Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez, who decide in the 1970s that they are going to build an organization that is powerful enough and capable enough of uh, empowering low-income people, um, working people, poor people, build an organization that crosses class lines, crosses racial lines, and build an organization powerful enough uh, to make a difference by empowering the poor to help them help themselves. Uh, so it's I'm going to take you back to 1970, and um, I'm going to talk to you about the founder, his name was Wade Rathke, he grew up in the South of New Orleans in the 50s and 60s, which was a time of widespread opposition to school integration, and uh, this is how it goes. Early on the morning of May 25th, 1970, a determined young man packed his belongings, his clothes, his wife's clothes, and his only piece of furniture, a rocking chair, into his 1967 Datsun station wagon. He slid into the front seat and began a 1,500 mile trip from Boston to Little Rock, Arkansas, uncertain of his future, but convinced he could transform American politics. He planned to help the poor by organizing them into a powerful political force. In 21, Ray Boatby had already come a long way. Two years earlier, he had been a sophomore at Williams College, and like many students of that era, he had joined the radical activist group Students for a Democratic Society and agitated, agitated against the Vietnam War. If Boatby found the Williams students elitist, the professors dull, and the courses irrelevant to his aspirations. In January 1968, he dropped out and headed south to his hometown to organize resistance to the war. His father, Edmund, an auditor who lived in a middle-class neighborhood of New Orleans, was furious. You're an Eagle Scout, he cried. Now you're a traitor and a dropout. Rappy was disturbed and moved by his father's tirade. He didn't live at home, he did not want his father's money. To get by, he worked as a busboy, then a print dryer, and finally as a lift truck driver. He volunteered as a graph counselor and organized college demonstrations against the war. Yet after six months, Rathke found himself as restless and frustrated as he'd been at Williams. He was tired of advising pampered college students on how they could afford military service. The students were not the blacks. Puerto Ricans and working families, many of whom I have worked with and who are really suffering in America. Rathke was not, as he put it, interested in setting up a bureau, a service bureau for upper middle class college kids. Like many students of 1968, Rathke believed that times were right for world shattering change. The anti war movement had become so powerful that it forced Lyndon Johnson not to seek election, yet Rathke felt the hopes of 1968 were not coming to fruition, partly because many anti-war leaders had contempt or indifference to working class people. So then he goes on, he gets a job working at a poverty agency, and, but he gets enamored with a group called the Welfare Rights Organization. And there he, admires, he goes to a demonstration and he sees the leader of the Welfare Rights Organization, a fellow by the name of George Wiley, an inspiring, charismatic figure. And he, he really wants to join this organization. And why we believe that the future of the welfare rights organization really depended on hiring effective community organizers. So he's at a, he's at a demonstration, and uh, one of uh, Rathke's uh, top community organizers comes up and approaches him uh, with an eye toward recruiting him. His name is Bill Pashkrek, and he knew. Bill Patrick knew about Rathke's anti-war organizing and approached him at the rally in offer. We need you to open up a welfare rights office in Springfield, Massachusetts, Rathke replied. Uh, let me think about it. He saw a wildly charismatic leader with a hopeful strategy and he wanted to work for him. Even though it would only be a summer job, he and his wife Lee agreed 
that the welfare rights movement had more potential to change things than did his work at the local poverty agency. He called Pashkrai trying to leave him with the impression that he was an experienced organizer. That, uh, I don't know about your welfare rights organization, he said, but let me take a look at Springfield to see if it's right for organizing. In fact, he knew nothing about organizing poor people, and years later he would say, I wouldn't have known if the neighborhood in Springfield was right for organizing if they bit me in the ass. Pashkrai was not fooled, but he knew Rathke was smart, had organized students, and had that fire in the belly that, with good mentoring, helped turn young idealists into effective activists. How soon can you do that? I'll check it out next weekend, Rathke promised. When Lee came home from work, Wade told her about his plan to visit Springfield that weekend, August 15th, 1969. I got tickets to the Woodfed Woodstock Festival, she protested. But I promised Phil I'd go, out, go check out Springfield, Wade answered. There'll be other rock concerts. Looking back, Rathke would think of Woodstock as a symbolic moment that separated the political activists for the mostly high-dyed and bearded cultural ones. So, the question, the, 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 why I was saying, people always ask me why did I write this book, and I tell them that I was involved, as Mark had said at the, in its introduction, I've been involved in the front lines of social justice for years, doing all sorts of things. An organizer, a lawyer, writing, propagandist, uh, and I realized how hard it is to make even a small difference. And, and also, it was, this was 2004, and I thought uh, all these organizations I worked with, I started a group, the uh, National Housing Institute, we published a magazine called Shelter Force, and around 1976, we helped generate lots of what I thought good housing activism, including helping to fight for uh, rent control, but the fact was that the American, the fundamental American values that I cherish, such as equality, opportunity, and community, and justice, were losing out to the values of greed and materialism. I was looking for a group that not only made a, di a difference, but a big difference. And I heard about this group, they come, I knew a little bit about them, I worked with them while I was an attorney at the LA, and they seemed to be making a bigger difference. Uh, so I wanted to find out if they were and how they did. And then, as Mark said, I had unprecedented access. I, I said to the leaders, I'm not going to write a book unless I have complete access to all your members, all your archives, your, your staff meetings, your board meetings, everything. And they reluctantly um, uh, uh, agreed. And most of the time, they followed that agreement. Sometimes there was a little negotiations back and forth. But it turned out I'm the only journalist to have ever had this kind of access, I'm the only journalist to have ever been at one of their board meetings or a staff meeting. And so I'm writing this book in real time, starting in 2004. So this is what I found. Uh, I'm writing this fascinating inside story that I think that uh, the largest, most effective in the property organization in America, perhaps the most effective progressive organization to emerge out of the 60s. And I'm showing from my front row seat how for 40 years this organization organized Americans from all walks of life, mostly minorities, uh, who got the short end of the stick. And I'm showing how they've rewritten the rules of activism rewritten the rules of community organizing by using this unusual, never heard of combination of strategies and tactics. I mean, they were combining union organizing with community organizing. They were doing in-your-face demonstrations, and they were involved in elections. Um, and they didn't seem to be um, any trade-offs. They seemed to be pulling off both all the time. And they also were doing something that was remarkable to the anti-poverty community, and that was they were actually going door to door and collecting dues from the people who were going to be members of the organization, and they were going to rely on those dues to pay the staff. Now, I don't know, anybody in the anti poverty movement or helping poor people, I'm going to tell you, you can't get any money out of poor people, you just get poor. 
Well, if you have an organization that is actually representing your group, there's a good chance that people will give money. And some paid up to $120 a year in dues. I found this quite remarkable. And then so I show uh, how the group, through these, uh, using these unorthodox methods, traditional community organizing and these other methods, how they built affordable housing, they registered a million voters, mostly poor minorities and the young, they raised workers' incomes by organizing unions and uh, passing living wage ordinances and inspiring others to do the same, they made banks accountable to their community, they stopped predatory lending, stopped banking discrimination, stopped foreclosures, turned garbage through lots into parks, um, they, they warned the nation about the dangers of the subprime loan. In 1999, they were involved in trying to stop predatory subprime loans. Uh, they also led the fight to save the lower ninth in New Orleans. Um, in fact, in the latest issue of The Nation, you can read my summary of that. Uh, in some ways, I'll give you one fact that summarizes its impact. An independent study estimated that from 1995 to 2004, ACORN had redirected an astonishing $15 billion from government and corporations to improve the lives of the, uh, and neighborhoods of low-income families uh, using this unusual but very sophisticated top-down and bottom-up uh, playbook. Um, you have to read more in the book to see this is, in some ways, just the tip of the iceberg. Um, they did have this wonderful playbook where they would come up with an issue like increasing the minimum wage or a livable wage. They would test it out in one city, say Chicago, taking on the most powerful mayor in America, um, Bill Daly, who was opposed to increasing the minimum wage for workers, for city workers, certain kinds of city workers that were employed in private industries, bus companies, healthcare workers. They would test it out in Chicago, see if they could win. If they could win, they would then export it to cities around the country. And that was their model. So one of their defining definitions was turning local organizing into a national organization, one of the only organizations that I know of that could that we might call progressive, they can actually win victories in the neighborhood, putting up a stop sign in a dangerous intersection, and also increase the minimum wage, which they did in 2007, forcing George Bush, against his will, to increase the minimum wage. And there was ACORN and its members with the Democratic Party leadership touting this wonderful uh, uh, reform. So anyway, I'm furiously trying to finish my book. Now, first of all, I thought I was going to finish the book in 2005, and then Katrina hit. And then some voter, the voter registration scandals hit. And uh, I'm trying to just keep up with uh, all what's going on with uh, Acorn. So now it's 2008. I am uh, furiously trying to finish this book. I'm describing, you know, uh, I'm, here to, uh, I'm describing a typing about how Acorn in 2008 registration campaign, one of the largest, if not the largest, in, in, in American history. Uh, um, they're going to register a million people for the 2008 election, um, they were, and they were going to target the swinging districts, you know what the swing districts mean? The, the states, and it could go Republican or Democratic, where it really mattered who you were going to register. So um, they, they were about to do this, they knew it was very dangerous because they had already been attacked by the Republican Party infrastructure and their allies for their 2004 to 2006 voter registration campaigns. Uh, viciously attacked, but it never got to a national story. Uh, but they also knew that the millions are working poor uh, and young people don't vote because the rules of registration are very complicated in America. Uh, also, there's voter intimidation, long lines, and, and uh, so on. But they're willing to take that risk. Why? Well, the answer is obvious. If you're a poor people's organization and you ignore elections where America determines how it's going to spend its money and whether it's going to go to defense spending or corporate welfare or whether it's going to go for affordable housing, uh, jobs, 
And uh, another issue, another uh, ways of solving problems for the poor, elections count. So they, they gear up and start doing this. I'm trying to follow it. I'm on the phone all the time asking what's going on. How many people even just there any problems? And uh, then something else happens that's huge in 2008. Uh, a longtime ally, a fellow by the name of Barack Obama, runs for the president. And uh, Obama and uh, John Edwards and Hillary Clinton are all vying for the endorsement, and they have support um, in their membership for each one. But eventually, they uh, take a reading of their membership, and uh, a large majority uh, one of them support Obama. He seeks their endorsement, he gets it, and then this is what happens. Now we're following uh, Bertha Lewis, who is the, becomes the new head of, uh, of ACORN. It's three weeks before the presidential election. So three weeks before the 2000 presidential election, Bertha Lewis rushed from her office to her Brooklyn apartment to catch the televised debate between Barack Obama and John McCain. Lewis, an African American, had a special interest in the debate since during the Democratic primaries, Obama had sought and received a corn's endorsement. Born to a teenage mother in a Florida migrant camp in 1951, Lewis had taken over as head of Acorn. A razor sharp, inspiring leader, she previously led Acorn's New York chapter and had been called by Crane's New York Magazine one of the hundred most influential women of New York. New York Magazine concurred naming her one of the state's political influentials. Uh, I just said it's because she was the head of the New York uh, Acorn chapter. Wearing a brightly colored African dress, Lewis had spent most of the day at Acorn's New York headquarters in Brooklyn on the cell phone and at meetings juggling her time among politicians, foundation executives, and staff. Her office, like many of Acorn's 103 operating in cities across the country was humming with people, young and old, many working day and night, hoping the poor fight for a better life. So Acorn was often at the center of controversy. Powerful politicians such as Bill and Hillary Clinton and Ted Kennedy and celebrities such as <coughs> Roseanne Barr supported Acorn's work and spoke at its national events. Lewis was, was responsible for an organization with more than 600 staff, thousands of low and moderate income members, dozens of coalition partners, and over 100 chapters in 42 states. And on the day of the debate, she had spent hours talking to reporters, her heart pounding with a rush of adrenaline, denying allegations by Republicans that Acorn was involved in voter fraud. Weary from her long day running the organization and sparring with the media, Lewis looked forward to relaxing in her living room and watching Obama do well. She struggled to stay awake, and suddenly her eyes opened wide, her brief tranquility shattered. John McCain, before millions of viewers, was warning the nation that a group called Acorn, who he linked to Obama, is now on the verge of maybe perpetrating one of the greatest frauds in voter history in this country. Acorn said, was destroying the fabric of democracy. She stood and yelled at the TV. He just attacked Acorn. She knew how ruthless Republicans could be. They tried to destroy Acorn's reputation before as part of the Attorney Gate scandal in 2006. She had been amused when the Acorn sarcastically attacked her union organizers in their national nominating convention, mocking Obama's experience as an organizer in Chicago. Sarah Palin, in her acceptance speech for the GOP vice presidential nomination, had declared, I guess a small town mayor is sort of like a community organizer, except that you have actual responsibilities. But never did Lewis imagine that Acorn would become an issue in the presidential campaign. Calls started coming from staff and members. Now, the tradition of a seasoned community organizer, Lewis tried to turn a bad situation into an opportunity. Look at it this way. We 
finally made the big time after all these years. Now, let's make sure they spell our name right. Vilified by McCain, ACORN had become part of the national debate. During October, there were 1,737 news stories about ACORN mostly negative. Now, up to that point, nobody, nobody heard of ACORN. There were no national, there was maybe one or two national news stories trying to describe this complex organization. Um, okay, so the next thing that happens, which you all remember, is Obama becomes president. And then, suddenly, in less than a year and a half after his election, in certainly one of the most bizarre political events in this or any decade, ACORN, this large, respected group, is destroyed, closed, all its doors, 700 chapters, done. The right wing of the Republican Party, its business allies and Fox News, had unleashed a ferocious attack on the group. The attack, of course, included voter fraud allegations, videos claiming to show icon staff all over the country aiding and abetting prostitution. And like I said, when I started writing this book, I thought I was writing a book about a group that nobody ever heard of, that they needed to know about. Now I was writing a book that 80% of the American people knew about, but what they knew was wrong. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think I set the stage for you to think about how this could happen. And I'd be interested to actually hear how could, in your mind, how did this happen? How did this happen? And a question that I'm going to ask you to um, speak to the mic because this has been uh, taped by uh, Homeland Security. <laughs> Hi, John. I just want to tell you that I read your book, and the first thing that comes to my mind of uh, uh, the, the enormity of the challenge you have in documenting, as you said, in real time, enormous amounts of characters and data. It's, it's like Robert Carroll's uh, the, the, the power of Where did you know about it? Oh, I know. It's an but, admirable comparison. Well, to me, your, your work here is so, uh, so finely wrought and detailed you bring your learning skills, you have a writing style that's documentary and compelling. I just want you to know that I appreciated that a great deal. Um, and I'm also very familiar with the Acorn story, having been involved in making a film about it. My question is oh, this. Okay. Yes. My question is this. You asked how, how do we explain this? I, I, I have one little, uh, um, I was yelling at a television my brother too. And the night that I yelled at a television, it was a Larry King show. Live was Michael Moore on the Larry King show. It was the night that he introduced, was introducing his film Capitalism, a love story, which I had seen. That he was rolling it out and doing all the promotions that Michael Moore generates with, with merit. And Larry King did something very unusual, and he surprised Michael Moore. I don't know if that was some uh, dramatic device or whatever it was. He said, Michael, had you seen the Acorn video? And Michael Moore said, no, what's that? He said, well, let me show you. And then when Larry King showed the world, CNN, again, something that had been broken and had been pushed by, by the right part and the right wing media machine, uh, machine. He played the so-called uh, O'Keefe Pin video. And I don't know how many people here have ever seen it. It's, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. It's been, uh, I did an analysis of the video. We have found that many entire thing was a hoax. But Michael Moore's response, in real time, that night, live in front of the world was when Larry King said, well, Michael, what do you think of that video? And Michael Moore looked at me and said, well, I really need to see the camera. That's his entire response. Michael Moore, Oprah, Spike Lee, you tell me one person in the media that came to the aid of ACORN. Who said SOS? ACORN had four, five hundred thousand uh, uh, motivated and effective membership, the largest in the country, and the, the ship went down like the Titanic, and the entire progressive community, you know, and, and I, by that I include everything from the New York Times who were complicit in this, and had an editor's op 
page that said they were sorry for propagating, but they knew Jews were and the aluminum tubes that Acorn went down and went, and went down and inflated so rapidly. And to this day, no one knows why. You've asked the question. I want to know where was the progressive side? Where were the elements that should have been standing up? Yeah, Mark. And calling for <laughs> everyone. Book, Madison Square Garden. Let's do what they did back in the 50s when the Communist Party was attacked. The same way. Bill of Attainer legislation, defunding. Let's have call out everybody to get in the streets. Come to the aid of Acorn. So obviously you're as, as shocked as I am about what's happened, but Acorn is gone. And look what Brian Park did with the other day. He did it again. Yeah, Mark. What um, that was your response. Uh, I'm just, uh, I don't mean to neglect it. I, 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 uh, the, it's a complicated story, as you know. And to me, the progressive response was sort of the last rung on why Acorn went down. But, uh, you know, well, let's take a few more questions before, I, before, before we hurry on. Yeah. Uh, because I, I can't help it. Okay, I have to, I have to speak to this. Um, the progressive community, so-called, and the left in general, and, and liberals generally, and most of the Democratic Party, uh, is militantly uh, uh, resistant to any close examination of what's happened in our elections over the last 10 years. The Acorn story is intimately connected with the story of the Republicans after the election. We could talk at great length and in great detail about how carefully the um, Republicans worked to demonize ACORN for, as, as John has said, doing precisely what the Republicans do, although with far greater sophistication. Okay? But the fact of the matter is that when it comes to getting people to focus on the evidence of stolen elections in the last 10 years, after 2000, uh, Michael Moore refuses to discuss it. The nation refuses to discuss it. As a matter of fact, um, what has happened to most of the evidence of fraud in 2004 as well as 2002, 2006, is that it has been ignored by the mainstream press and laugh off by the left press. You may remember that Bobby Kennedy Jr. had a couple of great cases in Rolling Stone about the voting machines and the theft of the election, right? Uh, that case was attacked in Salon. It was attacked in Mother Jones. He was called a uh, member of the far left, as was I, okay? Uh, so it, it is a very peculiar thing you're asking about. It's very, very strange that nobody came to ACORN's defense, and that includes Obama, right, who was supposedly their lawyer and, and whose election they supposedly enabled and all this, and say a word about it. He signed the bill. That he wants to sign the bill that defunded them. That's absolutely right. Uh, but it is, it, is, it is probably the scariest question that could be, that could be asked to ask. But, uh, you know, I mean, we can go on and on. The, the people in this room believe you have no idea you cannot have any idea because it's never covered, it's never discussed. The extent, the sophistication, the scale of the fraud uh, by the Republicans is, is really, really staggering. And let me just say one quick thing, because this is not my evening, although we're sort of joined at the hip here. What we're talking about is not a, is not a finished story. Carl Rove has started a new company called American Crossroads. Its whole purpose is to help the Republicans steal elections this fall. The, the pre-propaganda has been laid because everybody's saying the Democrats can be screwed, they're gonna take a bath, they're never gonna be able to win. This is the year of the Tea Party and the right is resurgent and all this crap, okay? A, a paper was recently released by the Election Defense Alliance which studied the hand-counted ballots in the election that gave us Scott Brown in Teddy Kennedy's Senate seat, the special election. Uh, surprise victory by Scott Brown. Nobody expected him to win. Well, they counted all the hand-counted ballots in that election, 65,000 of them, and found that Martha Copley had actually won those ballots by over five points. 
but where the ballots were counted invisibly by a technology that nobody can check, and it's owned by private companies with links to the Republican Party. Those votes uh, made Scott Brown the winner by two points. There's tons of stuff like this, okay? The point is that the acorn story is continuing uh, and will continue this fall, even though the organization has been, has been destroyed. Uh, on a positive note, uh, there is the former acorn organizers, along with their allies and some new people uh, who were attracted to acorn as being one of the few successful groups on the left, uh, are uh, helping to remobilize and we, I, I would anticipate that the, at least in a dozen states, uh, a new organization using ACORN's model and its tactics and strategies and its community organizing methods, including door-to-door -door organizing, will result in something um, to come out that, that will um, be, be something, but it won't be quite what ACORN was. I don't think anybody can understand how hard it was to build a national poor people's organization with 400,000 dues-paying members. That is a huge loss to America. I don't care who you are. You could be a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent. If we care uh, and cherish ideas of opportunity and equality, the loss of Acorn is a tremendous, tremendous event. Um, let's see, any other, uh, yeah. Yeah, first a question. Um, so what is this organization that's going to grow out of the Phoenix that's going to come out of Acorn's ashes? Well, in New York, it's New York's community, New York Communities for Change. I think it's important that we know yes. this. Yes. Okay. It's, a, it's an organization that's not ACORN. They have nothing to do with the former ACORN. New York Communities, do they have a website? Yes. NY Communities for Change? Yes. Plural. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got me there. But I think it's New York Communities for Change. Okay. But you'll, you'll be able to find okay. it. Okay. And, uh, and everybody should be looking for them. Mm -hmm. And you should be supporting them. Oh, because yeah. it is a... It is a Next best thing to acorn works. I'll take a look when I get home and send it right out. But in the meantime, I, I do want to say one of the things that strikes me continuously is whenever you watch a news program, you, there is this format now of you've got to have both sides of the of the um, issue and quote unquote balance. And you have the Republican liar and the whatever uh, opposition. And we have no way of articulating how to deal with these lies. I think it's really important that really there's a modus operandi that be developed. Because I just, I think basically, um, it, when you're confronted, with an unexpected lie. It's very, if you can't just shout, it's not true, it's not true. Right. Well, you have to have a way of doing it, and I think it's really important for that to happen. And the last thing I want to say is, I think the level, the mental level of the people who are in public, um, television media, which is still the basic source of news, is abysmal. They're so you know, and I think that's part of the problem. So let me let me uh, comment on what happened factually in the in the reporting of, of the Acorn story. What you had was the an all-out assault. You know, the, the facts. Nobody who, who cared uh, by Fox News. It's a blog, the right-wing bloggers here and the Republican Party all working together uh, to come out with one story. ACORN was an evil organization, and all those misdeeds I listed at the begin, beginning of my talk, which we can attribute to the Republicans, they tagged with ACORN. There was no, ACORN never had a chance to respond. 
Uh, and if they did, they'd be drowned out by their old eyelids and Hannity's yelling and screaming at them. And it was a repetition 24-7 of those videos of the phony videos of the pimp and the prostitute. That's one, that's what the right wing press. The mainstream media did two things. First, and this, I would attribute this to being not maybe the most important reason for ACORN going under. If Fox News is going to attack people on the left, is that surprising? If they're going to distort the stories, they're going to do that. What we rely on is the reporting of the New York Times and the Washington Post. Well, first of all, the New York Times and the Washington Post, instead of doing an independent investigation, instead of using their tra honest tradition of reportorial skepticism, seemed in this case to throw that all out the window which is raises the mystery of one, and just regurgitated and repeated what they saw on Fox News. The New York Times, one week after the phony videotapes were shown on television, said and reported that this guy, James O'Keefe, came into the office dressed in his cartoonish outfit, looking like a super fly pimp. That turned out to be totally wrong. He never entered any office looking like that. But what did that do? Particularly not to the general uh, uh, reader, but the people who cared about ACORN and were worried about ACORN, and the people who funded ACORN, and its Democratic Party supporters. Once the New York Times gave its imprimatur to this factual narrative, what was the message it sent? It said, you thought you knew about it before. You were a foundation executive. You were on the board of the Ford Foundation or the board of some other large, wealthy foundation. You thought you were funding an organization that was fighting against poverty. Well, look what they got on the front lines here. They have a bunch of buffoons. Not only were they giving information to help facilitate prostitution, <laughs> they couldn't even tell the difference between a real and a phony pimp. So what was the message? The message was, run for the hills. At first, I don't want to be attacked by Fox News and the Republican Party if I'm a foundation executive. And the second message was, you know, this organization may not be what I thought it was, or if it is, it has some serious problems. The Democratic Party leaders, Senator Schumer, who knew better, who had worked with ACORN, ran for the hills. Foundation. The liberal foundations, liberal donors, ran for the hills. Now, in some ways, you can't blame them. They're never relying on the New York Times to get their factual information. Uh, and they were scared. You know, they are culpable in some ways, but it's also understandable in some ways. Uh, now, uh, as uh, you said, that the, the New York Times eventually had to say, oh, we got it wrong. Of course, that was two years later, and ACORN was the bomb. They said, oh, we should have assigned one reporter instead of 16 to cover ACORN. Oh, four people's organization down the tubes. Just a minor mistake on our part. Uh, so uh, that was the worst of the reporting. The best of mainstream reporting went like this. On the one hand, the Republican Party saying that ACORN is committing voter fraud. On the other hand, ACORN denies it. That's what goes for reporting in America today about a group like ACORN. Now, there's one other thing that we need to talk about, at least I have grown to uh, think is important on this story. I'm, I'm wondering, why did the New York Times lose its usual skepticism? Uh, <laughs> why does the why the, does Andrew Breitbart, the new um, leader of the right wing media, why does he always use something related to race? He took down Van Jones, who was uh, Obama's African American environmental advisor. Uh, 
They went after Acorn. Why go after Acorn? Yeah, I mean, you could oppose them, you could criticize them, but why the viciousness? What was behind the intensity? This is an African American group. It raises questions in my mind about whether or not the a little elite journalists have a um, are unable, let's just put it kindly, to accurately report on an African American group, uh, especially one, especially a group as complex as Acorn. Uh, I think it raises issues that, that I generally uh, am skeptical about, which is blaming everything on race. But I think we've got to reevaluate and look at that. Um, what is driving this compassion against an organization like Acorn? Uh, so that's a new fact that we have to put in to understand um, what's going on with, with Acorn. Let me, uh, it's a new fact and it's a very old fact, right? Yes. Because there's a history here that goes back to, you know, the years after the Civil War and uh, attempts to disenfranchise black voters through, through any means you know, necessary. The story goes back that far. Let me uh, conclude by saying that it's not enough for us to, oh, it's necessary, it's not enough for us to encourage the successor groups right, that are springing out of the ashes of acorns. It's not enough. Because if anyone can establish connections between them and ACORN of any kind, they'll be vilified and stigmatized and destroyed in the same way. In, the, in, in conjunction with that hopeful, positive effort to connect with the successors to ACORN, we have to make this, the truth known. Wounds don't heal if they're not clean, okay? There has to be. Uh, uh, public awareness of the truth, and it can happen. I mean, this kind of stuff can happen, albeit belatedly. You know, at the time of the Hill Thomas hearings, nobody believed uh, Anita Hill. And after a couple of years of her, you know, appearing and speaking, people started, and, you know, certain books were published, Jane Mayer's book and so on, made it clear that, you know, she was the victim of another propaganda drive. She was smeared, and she was by Clarence Thomas, who was still on the Supreme Court, was lying as confirmation hearings and so on. So we, we, can, we can know the truth. We need a film on this, okay? But we also need to read John's book and tell people we know to read it. And I went and with a kind of naked plug for John's book. Uh, he was there, he knows the story. Uh, and so, you know, I, I urge you to take advantage of being here tonight, pick up a copy, have John sign it. And uh, let me thank you for coming. And uh, you can look at the bookstore's website to get the schedule of subsequent events. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, Peter Phillips here next next month. Uh, you know, he's the head of Project Censored. They've got a new collection of censored stories out. And we'll have people coming every month, and sometimes more often than that. So please do uh, join us. And thanks for coming.